Welcome to the 28th annual Convivium Dinner Auction, hosted on site virtually from Kenrick Glennon Seminary. I'm Father Jim Mason, President Rector of the Seminary. While I regret that we cannot be together this evening in person, I'm excited to welcome you to the heart of our mission. Our seminary is more than a school, a place of prayer, and a house of formation. It is, in fact, a home. And this virtual platform gives us the opportunity to bring our home to yours. Tonight is also about gratitude for you, for your support tonight allows us to educate and form these men as they prepare to serve you and your families as parish priests. Please continue to pray for our seminarians and know that we are praying for you. Before we launch into our program this evening, I would like to acknowledge all those who have contributed to this event, including the dedicated team of Convivian Auction Volunteers. Our platinum sponsors, Mike and Rita Mooney and the Tracy family. Gold sponsors, Kathleen and Paul Anderson, the Mulligan family, the Reverino family, the Shaughnessy family, the Archdiocese of St. Louis, and one anonymous gold sponsor. Silver sponsors, Annual Catholic Appeal, Dr. James and Cynthia Coyle, the Archdiocese of Kansas City and Kansas, Deacon John and Jenna O'Hara and family, the Archdiocese of Omaha, Dave and Diane Snively, and the Catholic Diocese of Wichita, and three anonymous silver sponsors. Thanks to our bronze sponsors and underwriters whose names were displayed in the slideshow this evening. Every year our guests tell me how much they enjoy getting to know our seminarians at Convivium. So before we check in with Father Paul Hazing, our Master of Ceremonies, I want you to first meet Robert Williams. Tonight he and many of the 139 men in formation are here to share their stories and thank you for supporting their priestly formation. Hello, my name is Robert Williams and I'm a seminarian from the Diocese of Tulsa. I'm 27 years old and I've only been in seminary for about a year and a half, but particularly this year, I wanna share with you how the Lord has been teaching me the gift, the treasure of community life. In seminary, we have quite a diverse potpourri of personalities, having over 130 guys here from all over the country. And what the Lord's been really showing me is, it's not enough to just learn about him, learn about his love in, in the classroom, or to just spend time with him in prayer and, and experience his love just between me and him. But that if I'm going to really grow and develop a pastoral heart, a fatherly heart, if I'm going to become the kind of priest that I aspire to that can really love and minister to the needs of a parish family, I need to be able to recognize and exercise that love I learn about and that I receive in prayer in the community that I'm a part of. And this year I've seen in my own brothers not only their strengths but also some of their weaknesses. And God's been inviting me to not only encourage them and build them up in those strengths that I recognize and speak truth from his heart to them and to reject lies that they might believe about themselves, but also to encourage them to grow in ways that I've recognized they might fall short at times. And on the flip side, I've been able to receive that gift from them, to be able to receive that, oh, there are places where I'm still weak and need to grow, and to have them call me on and encourage me in those weaknesses, but then also help me recognize places where I'm strong and have talents that I didn't expect. And in all of this, it becomes a real communion, a family, a community that is a true school of the divine love. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 28th Annual Convivium Auction. We're coming to you live from the seminary, the fireside room, in fact, for our first ever virtual event. I'm Father Paul Hazing. I'm Vice Rector for Formation here, and I'm honored to be your Master of Ceremonies this evening. Not shouting over a crowd, unfortunately. We would love to be all together as a crowd, living together, but this is how we're going to do it. As you heard, pre-theologian Robert Williams just shared, our community is a, is a family. And tonight I'm excited to share our family with yours. So I hope you enjoyed uh, your purchase party in place packages and are enjoying the meals delivered to your home earlier today. Uh, Convivium is our sole fundraising event for Kenrick Glennon Seminary, and the funds raised this evening support the formation of future priests, but tonight is so much more than a, a dollar amount. It, your participation shows that our seminarians are not alone in their formation, that you are partners in a mission to form healthy, holy, joy-filled parish priests, and we thank you for encouraging them. Before we proceed with our program, 
I have a few house, housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, don't forget to buy your 50-50 raffle tickets for your chance to take home half of the jackpot collected from the raffle sales. The jackpot is up to $9,575, so purchase your tickets soon uh, in the mobile bid bidding app site until 7.30, so act now. We've only got a few more minutes. Get those tickets. We'll draw the name of one winner at the end of the program. Secondly, the silent auction will remain open until 9 p.m. this evening. So bid high, bid often, and don't forget to set your max bids on the items you don't want to lose. In just a few minutes, we'll be joined by a few seminarians for a live question and answer segment here in this fireside. And you can submit your questions to those seminarians now by clicking the button above your screen or calling the help desk at 314-792-6105. The help desk, finally, that phone line will be open until 9.30 p.m. Seminarians are on the line now, ready to assist you with your auction-related needs. Now, at this time, I'd like to invite you to a sort of behind-the-scenes look into the daily life of the seminarians in a video the seminarians made themselves. Afterward, we'll hear from Jacob Braun, who is currently on an internship parish assignment for this whole year. Enjoy. So a Tuesday, wake up around 5:30, get ready a little quick. Yeah. Be in the you know chapel at six to pray, have that time with the Lord, that one-on-one -on -one time. Morning prayer at seven, which is as almost as old as the church itself. Again, praying the Psalms of David, the same Psalms that Jesus would have prayed in the uh, during his earthly life. And then we have the the mass at 7:30, and I really appreciate how here we do it where it can almost feel like almost every Sunday is, is like Easter Sunday because there's Mr. Wisniewski on the organ, there's a lot of reverence. Everyone is very well prepared for what they're doing. Class is really great. Class is what helps form us so that we're able to go and, and teach, go and be with the people of God. And we're really grateful to still be able to do that this year, especially. It'd be, and it'd be easy to form this attitude of it. It's all about me. But really on my internship, I learned that these classes are for my people. They're for the people I'm going to minister to. And so if I can't sacrifice now, how will I be able to sacrifice in four years or two years or whatever it is? Um, and so I, I think it just shows that the more and more I say yes to the little things, the more and more Christ is transforming me. Yeah, I would say human formation is really geared at understanding, you know, who am I as a person? You know, in a, in a very way, real way, it's very spiritual because it's knowing myself as a beloved son, but... In that identity, there can be lies that can come in, mm -hmm. false beliefs about who I am and how that impacts my behavior. Community life draws out our faults, but it also draws out what we do, uh, you know, what, what our uh, you know, good qualities are as well. So there's both. So each year in our formation, we're given a different, different specific assignment for pastoral formation. And so some years men will teach. Uh, normally as you start, you're just a presence at the parish, and then you'll move into teaching, bring communion calls, and then of course as a deacon you're able to do baptisms and, and to preach as well. To give ourselves to the people of God helps us stay focused on what, what we're doing here, why are we here, um, yeah, so that we can be priests of God for the people of God. Well, a pastoral formation is described as the goal or the, the final end of all of the other formation that happens here. Ideally, when you're ordained, the bishop ordains you and gives you the task of being a shepherd to the faithful. Uh, so that, I think, has to stay in your mind as you're going about your day-to-day -day activities while you're here. Uh, one of the things that, one of the challenges of COVID was the, you know, being distanced, being distanced from our brothers. Um, uh, there's many opportunities we've had that we wouldn't have normally. So the soccer on Friday, like we're playing against each other, I think that's really cool because in the past it was fun that we played other seminaries or other teams, but I think it's shown us older guys that we can, this, is, this, this can continue after COVID. There can be more intentionality. Usually as I'm walking out of Mass, we have a, a cloister, a courtyard, and after Mass I usually cut through the courtyard to get some fresh air. I think of a, a prayer that is in Psalm 16 where it says, the lot marked out for me is my delight. The way the courtyard is structured really brings home that point of being grateful to God for the place that he has put me 
right now. Uh, the lot marked out for me is my delight. Welcome indeed the heritage that falls to me. Hi, my name is Jake Braun. I'm a seminarian for the Archdiocese of St. Louis, Missouri. I'm 27 years old and I'm spending my pastoral internship year here at Queen of All Saints. Uh, I've come to realize that there's a variety of pastoral experiences. And while it's easy to be with a family at a dinner table uh, and to be with them at the high moments of their life and get to know them as they experience their faith more deeply, it's a different kind of story to be with people, the people of God in a moment of tragedy. I've experienced this with the Missionaries of Charity in South Bronx, New York. And I experienced it especially this summer, being a chaplain at Mercy Hospital in the midst of a pandemic. It's scary to be in those moments, to be at the bedside of someone receiving CPR while trying to comfort the family and assure them that God is there and that he loves them. And it's in those moments that are so challenging and that are so scary that I realize I'm not enough for this vocation. And so it reminds me of the story of Jesus walking on the water and the Gospel of Matthew. It reminds me of the, the apostles being on the stormy sea and being afraid of what's going to happen because the boat might sink, and seeing a figure walking on the water towards them and thinking it's a ghost. It also reminds me of Peter, who hearing the voice of Jesus say, it is I, do not be afraid, says to Jesus, Lord, if that's really you, command me to come to you on the water. It's a prayer that in different words I had in those moments, where I realized that I was not enough, but that Jesus was, and that he can give me the strength to do what he does, even to walk on the water towards him. So thank you for all that you've done for Kenner Glennon Seminary. Uh, please pray for me and pray for my brother seminarians and all who are responsible for our formation. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob Braun. Great to hear from you down at Queen of All Saints. We're now joined by two St. Louis seminarians uh, in studio here, in our live studio. Uh, we're joined by Deacon Mitch Baer, who's in his fourth and final year of theology here at Kenrick. And we're also joined by Jeff Fenewald, uh, Mr. Jeff Fenewald at this time, and he's in second theology. Both are seminarians for the Archdiocese of St. Louis, as I mentioned. And we'll be taking questions throughout the evening, and this is a chance for you to ask really anything you like. And these two fellows are, are game, so... We'll start with some simple questions. Uh, first off, uh, men, you've been in the seminary now, what is it, four years? That's right. And this is year eight now. That eight I'm years, in? Yeah. respectively. So that already answers a few questions. How long does it take? Uh, you both had different tracks, right? Right. That's right. So you came in after being in college. Where did you go to college? I went to Benedictine College, Madison, okay. Kansas. Okay. And so then my total time in seminary will be seven years, okay. God willing. Okay. And you'll have an internship like Jacob. That's right. After this second theology. That's, that's the plan next year. Do you have a parish in mind? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to go anywhere. 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 You're just happy to be going. Okay, <laughs> that's right. great. Good. And you came out of high school. I did, yeah. So I graduated from Rockwood Summit in 2013. Rockwood's one of the big yeah. school districts in St. Louis. And so I was public schooled and then um, did three years at Glennon in the college program and then... Um, have been in theology ever since. So okay. this has been my home for a long time. It's kind of crazy to be at the end here. It is. It's amazing to, to see the men come together throughout the year and see how, well, you have your high schools that you went to, and both of you are public school. You're from what? That's right. Oh, yeah. Troy? Troy Buchanan. Yeah, Troy. So it, it's, it doesn't matter which high school a guy comes from. A guy comes from a place he grew up in a parish, and now he's here. And you really kind of learn what it is to... Uh, become a priest here, and some of the qualities of priesthood are, are probably dawning on you in the beginning, but they change over time. So one of the questions that was asked is, what are some of the qualities of a priest that, are, that you're really being formed in? What does the church look for in, in priests? Uh, what are some of the basic qualities? I think one of the biggest things, I mean, the simplest of things yeah. is that he knows Jesus and loves Jesus, right? Yeah. And I mean, this is the, the fundamental place of a calling is from Jesus. Mm -hmm. And um, so even before seminary, before formation, there has to be in some guy this, this relationship with mm -hmm. him. And, and that just lives and develops through the years. So I think that's the fundamental attribute and everything mm -hmm. sort of flows from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think being, being able to be loved by Jesus okay. is 
sometimes that's hard. Sometimes to receive love from, from our brothers, to receive love and formation from, from those who are in charge of our formation. We're doing our best. It's not always easy. I, I remember someone once described seminary as uh, open heart surgery, right. except you're, you're awake and you get to see it while it's happening. Yeah. And so the, any blockages of, that, of receiving that love need to be removed in this, in this time of open heart surgery. Yeah. And so, so, yeah, I think that's another quality, not only to, to love other people, but then this ability to be loved by Jesus. Yeah. This is not on the list of questions just here yet, but I just, both of you had the chance to go on the exercises. Uh, was that by your choice? Did you volunteer for that, or were you looking forward to that, or what was, what was your discernment for that? Yeah, that, I, that was absolutely volunteer. So I went on, it was a 30-day uh, spiritual exercises um, of St. Ignatius. And yeah, I mean, that was one of the most transformative moments of my formation. Mm-hmm. I got to just spend time in the middle of nowhere, South Dakota, mm-hmm. at, on this beautiful retreat center, and um, just really grow in that depth of, of love of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. What was it, it, what, yeah, that's not, it's not something that everyone gets to do or... Um, sure. And it's, it's something that's scary to a lot of people when they, when they ask, I'm sure you got the question too, well, what are you going to do for 30 days? And, right. and you, what do you mean you're going to be silent? And this, this time of listening, this time of, much like in seminary we grow in our ability to listen, mm-hmm. uh, this time of a, a 30-day spiritual mm-hmm. exercises is listening. How is the Lord speaking in my past experiences and my memories and my, in the things that are joyful, the things that are sorrowful? And then for him to continue to speak that way, mm-hmm. Carrying, carrying forward. I just went this past summer. I know it's been a little longer for Mitch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's just really opened my, my eyes to a whole new relationship with the Lord. Amen. Yeah. So that primary attribute of a priest is to know the love of the Lord, receive the love of the Lord, and really be able to listen to the Lord. That's, you've highlighted some of the foundations right there. Any other attributes you have in mind for priests that you need to be formed in here? I think also, I mean, just to be able to be open to relationship with just about anybody, right? I've been wearing this collar now for five years, going on five years as a theologian, and, uh, and you get all kinds of people coming at you no matter what time of day or where you're, you're at. You've got to be ready to receive anybody mm-hmm. where they're at. And um, so not only to have the capacity to respond to different people's needs who are maybe in tragedy or in a joyful moment and be able to meet them there, yeah. but also to really want that, yeah. uh, to want to be with people in that and okay. know that they're coming. So Great. Yeah. Great. Well, we're going to close for now. That's a few questions we tackled already. There's more coming, certainly from you folks out there. Send your questions in and we'll, we'll give them, uh, they're on the heights, hot seat, so give them, all, give them all you got. We'll be back later with... Uh, an update with um, another live Q&A segment. So keep submitting your questions. Well, Cardinal, this is uh, a great privilege. We've got uh, the 28th annual uh, Convivium. And I think it's 28 years ago that you started here as vice rector. 1992, is that right? You were vice rector? You would be right, Father Hazing. Uh, From 1992 to 1994, I served okay. as a, a spiritual director at Kenrick Lennon Seminary. They were two very happy years. I am so grateful to you guys. I'm so proud, first of all, these people who were kind enough to be listening to us. These were two of my seminarians, and I'm, I'm so proud of them. So I, in fact, when they were kind enough a year or so ago to ask me to give a day of recollection at Kenrick Lennon, I said, I feel like I'm talking to my spiritual grandchildren because you're your formators were my spiritual, in a way, spiritual generation of when I was rector. But you do, and there's, you, you too will find, and those who share in your sacred apostolate of priestly uh, formation on the excellent faculty that you have there, they, the, the great satisfaction that we have when we see how the guys are doing in parishes and in teaching, uh, in leadership positions like you guys got, or the, the pride that you'd have in a Dave Toops or Billy Byrne was before you guys, wasn't he? He was just named a bishop in, uh, in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, to take Archbishop Rosansky's place. But that gives you great satisfaction. As in a parish priest, you know, when we, when we might have the wedding of somebody we baptized or might do the First Holy Communion of somebody to, whose parents receive First Holy Communion. There's a great satisfaction when you see that symphony of the faith 
And that's why an evening like this convivium is so important to see the friends and the families of the seminary that, that help, uh, that help make the seminary the place of love and tenderness and embrace that it's meant to be by Holy Mother Church. So you guys, uh, Father Mason, Father Hazing, in seminary work, you are very, you're almost like meteorologists, knowing you see the winds and you see the drifts, you see the storms too, that's going on in the life, in the life of the church. And that's one of the benefits that I really enjoyed about, pre, about priestly formation. That's why I want to thank you for always supporting us and supporting the ordination of future priests that can be healthy, holy, joy-filled parish priests, you know, serve, configuring their hearts to Christ and bringing Christ to, to all those. In yeah. Need. Well, Cardinal, you've been in St. Louis now, a wedding a few weeks ago, a funeral a, a week ago or so, and now you'll be on screen again in front of probably seven or 800 people who are going to tune into this. Uh, would you have any final message for the supporters of Kendrick Seminary? before uh, concluding this evening. Sure I would. Thanks, Father Hazing and Father Mason. Yeah, my final message would be thank you. Thanks for what you've done and keep it up. You you realize, um, benefactors and friends of Kenrick Lennon, the heritage that we have in St. Louis with the Vincentian Fathers. St. Vincent de Paul is the secondary patron of the Archdiocese, and the Vincentian Fathers uh, were had a, a long pedigree of uh, leadership and priestly formation. And St. Vincent de Paul had a great line that to support priests in formation is the most dignified charity that we can do. And uh, and think of that tonight. Think of that tonight. You know, one of the best ways we can assure that the church is going to continue as radiant as it should be, the sacrament of salvation to the world, as the Second Vatican Council says, is by supporting the formation of our future priests. And you got a great home product in, in Kenrick Lennon. So encourage uh, young men to go, go there, encourage vocations, and support them once they're in by being good to Kenrick Lennon Seminary. The people of the Archdiocese of St. Louis and the dozens and dozens of great dioceses and archdioceses that support and, and invest in the seminary, they've never let us down. And we're counting on you. As a product of that, thank you. And as as one who now knows nationally the importance of of, of solid, happy, uh, healthy, holy priests. Keep up the good work because we need you more than ever. Thank you. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, what you didn't see on the camera was the cigar he was smoking when he arrived at that moment. And uh, always in character, always a great friend of the seminary. And he signs his letters to me, Siempre il Rettore. He's always the rector. And he's my rector. And uh, I will always pay homage to the gift he gave in his formation of me as a priest. And he continues to form priests through us. And uh, it was great to reminisce with him and see him uh, be so generous with his time. Uh, It was a half-hour conversation, as you might imagine. It was cut down, but it was well worth our time with him. And so so thanks to Cardinal Dolan for his support of this place. And before heading into our next segment, I have a few important auction items, uh, some reminders. Uh, The 50-50 raffle will close in just a few minutes. The jackpot is up to $11,775, so buy your $25 ticket now on the mobile bidding site. I also want to draw your attention to nine great auction items. They're oral auction items. The first item is always a convivium favorite. It's dinner with the Archbishop on either February 12th or April 24th. Uh, Number two is a VIP tour and testing and tasting at Looks Row distillery in Kentucky, including hotel accommodations for your group of eight people. Right now, the bid is at $3,000, $3,050. So let's see if that can't go up. The value, of course, is priceless for many of these. The next item, number three, is dinner with the rector, Father Jim Mason, for 10 to 12 guests that's here at the seminary. Right now, it's at ten grand and $150. So $10,150 for the rector's dinner so far. Let's see how high we can go there. Uh, Next is number four. Uh, The best item of them all, of course, is dinner with the vice rectors, hosted by myself and Father Jason Schumer, the vice rector for the college. And right now, that value is priceless, but uh, the bid is at $2,100. So really, I mean, we got to catch up to the rector a little bit, save some face. Please help us out. Uh, $2,100 right now is where the bid is. So number five is a date night for uh, a year, which includes 
Uh, gift certificates, some of the best restaurants in town. So all year long, you get these gift certificates. The bid right now is at uh, $1,480. Uh, the value is $2,000. So. Number six is a family trip to Orlando, Florida from June 5th to the 12th. That's in 2021, so next summer. The value is $1,400. The bid right now is $990. So let's give that bid some TLC. And number seven is a Kimswick weekend getaway. And this includes dinner with uh, my friend, Father Dan Shaughnessy, at uh, St. Joseph Parish down there in Imperial. The value, of course, is priceless with Father Dan Shaughnessy, and the bid right now is at $1,300. And eight, number eight is a wood-burned round coffee table made by Father Mirko Socio, who's one of our spiritual directors, our beloved spiritual directors, native Italian. His dad's a craftsman. He himself is a craftsman out of Lombardy, Italy. And so you've got to handcrafted Lombardi Italian table right in front of you. It's priceless, and it's at $600 right now is the bid. So please bid a high and bid often. Lastly, number nine is a beautiful hand-painted Italian crucifix. So with all these items, all these oral auction items, uh, you can search for the number in your mobile bidding device or click on the oral auction tab. Now I'd like to send you to Mary Mother of the Word Chapel and introduce you to Emmanuel Medina. Emmanuel would like, to take, would like to take a, a moment to share with you a little bit about its own journey and formation. Hello everyone, my name is Emmanuel Medina. I'm 31 years old. I'm a second year theologian here at Henry Grand Seminary. I come from the Diocese of Belize City and Belmopan. When I first came here to the seminary, I thought I was going to come here and learn everything I can learn about Jesus and God, but I was dead wrong. I realized it's not about knowing all these things about Him, but it is about knowing Him personally and intimately. One of the ways that I have been able to grow in that intimate relationship with Jesus is through my holy hours. In my holy hours, I have been able to attentively listen and respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and has allowed me to grow intimately in union with Christ. At the same time, it is through my holy hours that I have been able to conform my heart to the heart of Jesus, High Priest. As the great Maxim says, we cannot give what we don't have. And it is only yeah, when we it. have Jesus in our hearts that we can bring Jesus to others. And this is the heart of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And I want to thank you for being part of it. Emmanuel is one of our four seminarians from the country of Belize. Uh, not many folks know this, but uh, the Diocese of Belize, Belmopan, has been sending seminarians to Kenrick for decades now. And the current bishop, in fact, and the previous bishop, uh, two of the immediate predecessors to this bishop, were alumni of Kenrick Seminary. And we have 22 sending dioceses in addition to St. Louis, and mostly are from the Midwest, but from as far away as Vietnam and Belize. So thank you, Emmanuel, for that beautiful witness. Right now I'm back with the seminarians for uh, some quick Q&A, and uh, they're here to answer your questions in this final segment of Q&A. Uh, so let's get started, Deacon Mitchell and Jeff. Here we go. Uh, why is seminary so long? Why does it take so long? Yeah, we, I get that question a lot. And what I always default to is you, you probably wouldn't get surgery or get operated on by a guy who went through the fast track community college uh, for just two years. Right. Uh, and so it, it, it makes sense that if we're, sometimes people use the term soul doctors, mm -hmm. it makes sense if we're caring for the hearts, the souls, and, and the lives of our parishioners, many, many people, mm -hmm that this is something that we wouldn't want to rush, this is something that we would want to take time to form, and that, that entails us being healed and us being formed uh, in personally as well. Okay. Yeah, my older sister will tell you I needed all eight years. <laughs> Your family would tell you that, uh -huh. sure. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so as you're in the seminary for all that time, what, what are the living, living arrangements like? You, you have, is, it, uh, is it just a building with beds? I mean, what are you talking here? <laughs> What's this place look like? No, we, we, so we actually, this is part of the, the seminary renovation we had in 2012, so eight years ago now. Right. Um, and the, the design of the rooms now are suites, style rooms, most of them. So we share a bathroom between two guys. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's really nice. And we each have a sink in our own rooms. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And you have one common area for eating or you have other places you can eat? Or what's the arrangement there? So there's a student kitchen as well that we okay. use. So a little private get-togethers with classes or certain dioceses, uh, the, that's a place that's often used as well. That was a part of that same renovation. And right now we're full with 130 men in the house, so 131. Yep. That's a busy place. Yeah. How about this? What do you do for fun? Is there any fun that happens? 
No fun. None? No fun, okay. sir. Okay. No. <laughs> Plenty of fun. Okay. I, don't, I mean, the, there's nothing better than being able to just be in a building of a bunch of 130 of your best friends like you know so one of the best things is just being able to get together and hang out mm -hmm. and talk mm -hmm. um, but there's plenty also of um, like activities that we do we have a soccer field we have a tennis court we have a basketball court we have racquetball um, court in, right. the, in the gym so which is where the rector got injured not too long ago right that's right <laughs> yes we have, a, we have a frisbee golf thing out here don't frisbee we golf. Right? thanks at all yeah. yeah yeah so it's, it's 44 acres of lots of different things. We have a trail. You guys ever go on the trail at all? Yeah, the yeah, trail's great. 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 Uh, this is a factual uh, question. How many St. Louis seminarians are being ordained to the transitional diaconate and the priesthood this spring? Do you have those facts? Transitional diaconate is one, and then my class is six. So okay. six, six ordained to the priesthood this year. Six to the priesthood. So you'll all be assigned to parishes? Yeah, yeah. You'll get those assignments when? Right after the ordination mass. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys pray all the time? That's another question that came up. Mm -hmm. How much do you pray? We, we, we did a time study here at the seminary, how the seminaries spend their time. Do you pray all the time? Uh, we, I think we, talking to people in the parish, I think we pray uh, a little bit more, a lot more, especially we, we have uh, a lot of luxuries here that allow for that, that time mm -hmm. to spend in prayer. We have the sisters that cook for us. And so that we can spend that time in study and spend that time in prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, that's just like Father Mason says, that this isn't just a school, this isn't just a, a place for prayer, but it's a place for all of these things. And so, uh, yeah, it's definitely, to, to go from class and to go to prayer and back and forth, it really points to the integration of the formation that we have here. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a way in which I've learned to pray all the time. I don't always do it, but I, I think that's my, my goal, right? First Thess Thessalonians says, pray without ceasing. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, there's a kind of line that we use sometimes that to, to pray always means that you have to pray sometimes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I take a lot of time in the mornings and we pray in the chapel together. We pray out of our breviary or our prayer book that all priests are required to pray on ordination. And, and sort of in doing that, it forms you into having this habit of prayer that, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of times now where I, I can go through my day and be praying for a lot of it. Now, mm -hmm. there are also times where that doesn't happen, but mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what I'm moving towards and growing towards. Sure, sure. Well, thanks for those answers. There's one question here. I'm hesitant to ask it, but uh, this comes from Father Mason's uh, sister, <laughs> and I think it's worthwhile. Uh, this is from Gina Swenson. Uh, take your time answering this question. We've got <laughs> oh, no. a little bit of time left here. Uh, this is the question. What do you really think of your rector, Father Mason? Do you have some <laughs> true thoughts, true facts about your rector that you'd like to offer this evening before concluding? I've got to be careful what I say here. You can say whatever you like. <laughs> the audience is waiting with bated breath. Here we go. Um, <laughs> well, the first thing I think to say about Father Mason is that he's not afraid to say what's on his mind. He's not afraid to say the truth. And so... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in a, in a world that's so easily offended, I think that's really refreshing for a lot of us here. Mm -hmm. And so even though we might not know what he's going to say next, a lot of us are really looking forward to what it is that he has to say. And even in his last formation conference, one of the guys at the end said, I, I could just listen to him talk all day. And, and this, is, this is a man who, who knows the Lord, and so it's, it's a joy to hear him. Okay. It's probably not the answer his sister wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> probably expected it, though. Yeah. He says what's on his mind in his family, too. So, No, Thanks we love him. We love Father Mason. Okay. Great. Well, man, thanks for your time this evening, your, your time answering these questions. And thanks so much for joining us, all of you, for this question-answer period. And all our friends and family at home, uh, we'll have this. Uh, Father Mason's in the foyer at the moment, and he's there with a special guest. But before we hear from him, I'd like you to first inter be introduced to Ben Wolf. Ben Wolf is a, a pre-theologian, so he's just starting here. And he spent the last uh, year at a Colby house, which is a house of discernment run by the vocation director, Father Fallon, here in St. Louis. So let's turn to, to Ben and hear from him. Hello, my name is Ben Wolf. I'm a seminarian for the Archdiocese of St. Louis. I'm 24, and I've been in seminary for two months. It has taken me my entire life for me to understand Christ's love for me. And because of that love, I just want to spend the rest of my life loving him back. My whole knowledge of God has only been in my head, and now, striving, I want it to be in my heart. And that's what this place has been so amazing. Even in these first two months, the staff and the formators have been supporting us not only in our intellectual formation, but also in our love for God and love for His people. 
So I want to thank you so much. Thank you for supporting me and ask for your continued support. I ask for your prayers because there's honestly no place I'd rather be. That was great to hear from pre-theologian Ben Wolf. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Archbishop Rosansky, who's been shepherding us for just a few months, but I can say in those few months, he's shown nothing but support for our seminary mission, and I am grateful to have him as our shepherd. Well, this is my first convivium, and I can only say I'm amazed and grateful for your support. The mission of the seminary, the formation of parish priests, is close to my heart, and now I've seen it for myself. It's close to your hearts as well. I'm sure we all wish we could be together in person, but under the circumstances, this gathering has been nothing short of extraordinary. I look forward to the time when we can meet face to face. Until then, let's continue to hold each other in gratitude and prayer, and know of my gratitude that we share this mission together. We could not do what we do, as well as we do, without your support. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you again, Archbishop Rosansky, and for all you've done for us. Now let's hear from collegiate seminarian Ben Mueller. Hi, my name is Ben Miller. I'm 21 years old today, and I'm studying for the Archdiocese of St. Louis. In 2019, I joined Kenner Glennon Seminary as a sophomore in the college. Prior to that year, I was in a fraternity house with over 100 men, and now, I've realized more and more as I've come to be formed in this house that I am made in the image and likeness of Christ. Prior to my formation, I tried to give people exactly what they wanted from me, trying to give them joy by being a mirror of their image of me. And now as I've come to know Christ, I've come to be formed in this house. I've come to know that all that matters is that I identify myself with Christ and continue to grow in the image that he has of me, to see myself in his eyes, so that wherever I go, God willing, if I join his priesthood, that I can be his image for his people. Please pray for me. Thanks to Ben Miller for that video, and it's great to have the Archbishop here with us this evening. I heard that many of you enjoyed his company in your homes this evening, too, the uh, flat Rosansky made his way into the dinner packages. Uh, Cardinal Dolan might say it's a round Rosansky. Uh, it's a Cardinal Dolan joke. But uh, they made, your, made it to your homes across St. Louis. And let's take a quick look at a few of the photos that you've offered uh, from home. So it looks like the sisters and uh, flat Rosansky showed up that, in that home as well. There he is again. He's showing up everywhere. Cheers. The children have flat Rosanskis. Look at those meals. Convivium bags, packages, look at how they arrived. Thank goodness. Cheers going all around. Wonderful. Thanks for sending all of those photos. It's wonderful to see you folks supporting the seminary from, from your homes. So it's so good to see you partying at home. Before we begin our, our final part of the program tonight, I'd like to draw your attention to just a few of the auction items that need some TLC. First auction item, number... Three, two, five. This is a handcrafted cross. So this was uh, 15 hours of work. Uh, Deacon Ben Franchuk's dad made this. It's a handcrafted cross. It's valued at 200. But to, to see this bid, uh, it's really a, an heirloom, a, a family heirloom of value. Uh, so let's see that bid go up. Uh, the next item is number 336. This is a scotch tasting. So listen, scotch is always worth your time. Uh, it's valued at 500 but uh, right now the bid's at $270, so let's see where that one can go next. The item uh, 398, uh, this is a discovery flight lesson for you plus a passenger to ride along. And that's valued at $200. let us see that bid go up from its 270 currently. So it's time now for our Fund and Need appeal. As many of you know, the Fund and Need supports the Biblical Archaeology course for the Deacon class in the Holy Land. Uh, and our fund and need goal this year is $155,000 because we have 19 men who are going to be on that journey. Uh, before we talk about what this year's trip will look like, let's take a quick look at last year's trip with now newly ordained alumni, Fathers Michael Trummer of the Diocese of Springfield 
and Father Travis Crotty of the Diocese of Sioux City, they recorded a special message last year on the banks of the Sea of Galilee. Enjoy. Yeah, so I want to share like, just a little brief reflection that I've been praying with. So uh, when we got here, originally we had Mass in the evening, and then as Father was holding up the host, the sun was actually setting uh, in the west. And I was thinking about how I have the host of, there's a host of Jesus here, and the, and the sun there, but really it's like Christ is a true light, as we heard uh, from the Gospel of John on Christmas Day. So then now we're at the, the sunrise and just still thinking about Christ being the, the true light. So it was cool to see the transition from, from darkness to light and just thinking about how Christ has been the, the light of my life. So that's what I've been praying with. And dawn often brings so much joy. The Psalms say that with darkness there's sorrow and pain, but with joy comes with dawn. So we're filled with so much joy and we thank you for your prayers and we ask that you continue to pray for us. So we'll continue to pray for you here in the Holy Land. Thanks, Father Trummer and Father Karate there. We'd like to start this fun and need this evening by calling out our first two giving levels. The first one is $25,000 and $15,000. To donate, search for item number 501 in the mobile bidding site or call 314-792-6105. And joining us via Zoom from the St. Louis Old Cathedral this evening is Father Charles Sampson, Associate Professor of New Testament here at Kenrick Seminary. And Father Sampson's ready to chat with some of our deacons about their upcoming experience. This will be Father Sampson's, I think it's his eighth trip to Israel and Palestine, and he will be guiding our 19 deacons on a three-week-long study of archaeology and theology in the very place where the Gospels themselves occurred. Hello, Father Sampson. Hello, I'm Father Sampson, and I am so happy to be here with you this evening to talk about our biblical archaeology trip to the Holy Land this December. With me are a few of our deacons that I will be taking to the lands of Israel. With me, we have Deacon Charlie Archer, Deacon Chris Rumbeck, and Deacon Luke Doyle. Deacons, it's good to be with you this evening to share with our generous supporters our trip and our mission to the Holy Lands. First up, we have Deacon Charlie Archer of the Archdiocese of St. Louis. Deacon Charlie, question for you. How do you think that this trip will help you come to know Jesus better? and even to pray better with him. Well, thanks for asking, Father. When I was first discerning or first entering seminary about five years ago, I read G.K. Chesterton's book, The Everlasting Man. And in this book, a line he says towards the end was very striking for me. He talked about the, the apostles when they were first going out and leaving the Holy Land. And he said, as they departed and went forth with this message that would transform the world, They didn't go as great philosophers or as great diplomats, uh, and quite frankly, the odds were stacked against them, but they went simply as messengers, uh, and they had that very simple message that Jesus Christ has died and risen and atoned for our sins, and salvation was opened up to us. And so as I've gone through seminary, and as I've prayed with this and done my ministry over the years, that has been something that stuck with me, that I'm really just carrying on that same message that the apostles first proclaimed. Uh, which they first heard from Jesus. And so to have the opportunity to go back to that place where Jesus himself proclaimed this message and first entrusted it to humankind and to walk a, like among those hills and to see the Jordan River and to hear the sounds and the sights that Jesus himself would have seen, um, I'm eager to see how that enriches my understanding of this most important message that he communicated and to understand the world as he saw it at that time. So I'm, I'm eager to see how this is enriching for my prayer uh, going forward. Amen. And it will be such a good opportunity to come into contact with that message where it was first proclaimed. Really, that this isn't just a distant thing from 2,000 years ago. This message is ours. This message is now. And this message is, in a way, here. I love to, sh- And I love showing all of the deacons, and I can't wait to take you to Nazareth, where the incarnation happened at the Annunciation. And there in a cave, there's an altar. And on that altar in Nazareth, there is an inscription that says, the word of God, peak, was made flesh. Mm. Deacon Charlie Archer, Latin scholar, what does the word heek mean? It means here. Here, exactly. Here, we get to come into contact with the events and message of our salvation. Can't wait to take you there. It's going to be so, so amazing. Anyway, thank you, Deacon Charlie. And now we'll turn it back over to Father Hazing to have an update on our fund-in-need donations. 
Thank you, Father Samson, and thank you all for your generosity in that first segment. Uh, specifically, we saw the fund and need, wow, uh, $39,375. If you recall, this was the moment of the convivium in which Archbishop Carlson would be calling out folks, seeing that bidding going up. Obviously, we're doing it a different way this evening, but let's see it keep going. We're going to continue now to the next two levels, $10,000 and $5,000. To give it these amounts, simply search again for item number 501 in the mobile bidding site or call 314-792-6105. And don't forget, your gift to the Fund in Need will support the Deacon's journey to the Holy Land, including airfare, hotel accommodations, tickets to numerous archaeological sites, plus other travel expenses. Now, if the COVID pandemic does prevent them from traveling, your donation will be used instead to offset the expenses for the annual retreat program, which includes a silent directed retreat uh, for each seminary and all the seminarians in January, which is a great expense, but will offset that expense. So now let's turn it back to Father Sampson for his continued uh, discussion with the deacons. Thank you, Father Hazing. Now we're joined by Deacon Chris Rumback of the Diocese of Wichita. Deacon Chris, hello. Hey, Father. Hey, it is so good to see you again. And I have something that I'd like to talk with you about. You've probably heard, or at least you will hear from me, that St. Jerome famously referred to the Holy Land as the fifth gospel. What did he mean by calling the land of Jesus the fifth gospel? Sure. So the gospels themselves give us information about Jesus. That's how he reveals himself to us. When we read the gospels, we see who Jesus was, what he said, what he did, and what his mission was. So when St. Jerome says that, the Holy Land is like a fifth gospel. He means that by visiting the Holy Land, we get information about Jesus. We learn about him by being in the culture where he lived, by being in the land where he lived and seeing the places where he spread the gospel for the first time. And so by stepping into the Holy Land, we're in a way stepping into the shoes of Jesus and you could say we're taking on the mind of Jesus. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that as Christians, we are all of one mind. And that's the mind of Jesus. So by going to the Holy Land, we get to read this fifth gospel. Amen. It sounds like you've studied Pauline literature before. <laughs> I appreciate the reference to St. Paul. And if I may bring this to you again, if you recall from your Pauline literature class here, we talk about Paul being a circumspect in his preaching. What on earth does that mean? And how especially like, can we relate this to Jesus in the, in the Holy Land? Sure. So circumspection means to look around. And what St. Paul means and what we mean about St. Paul when we use that term is that he looked at the culture and the place in which he preached and use the details about those things, as well as the details about the people, to more effectively preach the gospel to them. And so Jesus did the same thing in the Holy Land. He looked around at the culture and the people and the area in which he was, and used all of these things to preach more effectively. That is so true. And when you get to stand there in person, it all makes such sense. And like you said, we get to take on the mind of Christ to see how he thinks and how he works. One brief example of, of this is with Bethsaida. Turns out that in antiquity, there were two villages of Bethsaida, one on the Sea of Galilee that was built on sand, one a mile out of the Sea of Galilee that was built on volcanic rock. Guess where Jesus was standing when he gave his famous parable, teaching us and telling us, build your house not on sand, where the winds and the flood will sweep it away, but on rock. Bethsaida, he was there. He looked around and used the imagery of the land itself to preach the gospel. It makes everything come alive and be so real for us, rooted in those things. So Deacon Chris, thank you. And I cannot wait to take you in those places and show you those places. Thank you. And now we'll turn it back over to Father Hazing for another update on our donations. Thank you, Father Samson. Who doesn't want to go to the Holy Land with Father Samson? Sign me up right now, because that is a wealth of information, but really insight into the Gospels. Thank you all who donated as well to the Fund and Need. Scoreboard right now says we have 
dollars. We're almost halfway to our goal, but this is tremendous. This is the moment of the evening where we see lots of signs go up and uh, we're moving to this next level uh, at the $2,500 and the $1,000 level. Now at this time, I've got some exciting news to share. An anonymous donor has offered to give $10,000 if we receive 10 gifts at the $1,000 level. So to give, simply again, search for an item at 501 number, 501 in the mobile bidding site or call 314-792-6105. So one last time, we'll head back to Father Sampson for the final Holy Land segment. Thank you, Father Hazing. I'm back now joined with Deacon Luke Doyle of the Archdiocese of Kansas City. Deacon Luke, it's great to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks, Father. Hello, Convivium. Now, Deacon Luke, I hear that you've been to the Holy Land before. And not just that, but that you had a powerful experience there. Life-changing, one might even say. Would you care to share with us a little bit about that experience? Sure, absolutely, Father. Uh, So I think it's very true to say that it's impossible for any person to really meet the person of Jesus and not leave changed by it. And this is what happened to me the first and only time that I visited the Holy Land. You know some of my story, Father, that I was previously in the seminary. I spent a couple years with you studying theology in Rome. And I didn't have peace and freedom about whether or not Jesus was calling me to become a priest. And so I stepped away from seminary formation and began to teach the faith professionally in the Kansas City area. Fast forward a couple of years, and as Providence would have it, I found myself in the Holy Land for the first time in the summer of 2018. And not really being an international travel aficionado, if you will, I uh, definitely found myself struggling and suffering from the jet lag. And so a couple days into our trip, uh, I found that I was waking up kind of at all hours of the night. I think my body was still somewhere in the mid-Atlantic. And uh, we were staying right on the Sea of Galilee a couple days into our trip. And I found myself waking up very early one morning and couldn't get back to sleep. So I decided to go for for a walk, run, uh, to kind of just... Get, uh, burn off some energy, catch some fresh air, and to uh, take in the sun, uh, the sunrise over the Sea of Galilee. And I came to a place in the midst of this run that honestly I was just struck by its natural beauty. Um, I uh, stopped to catch my breath to stretch, kind of to just take in the view. And I decided to watch the sunrise coming up over the Sea of Galilee. And it blew me away as I was um, in this moment, and as the sun was coming up, uh, Jesus showed up. I hadn't really been praying. I, I knew that I was in his home region. uh, And it was very much on my heart that, okay, the Sea of Galilee hasn't moved in 2000 years. These mountains surrounding the sea, these towns haven't really moved in 2000 years. So everything is as it was uh, when Jesus was living here. But as I was in this moment watching the sun rise, there was a question that erupted from inside of me, a question that I had never asked myself and that I knew only could have come from Jesus. And that question revealed a lot of my heart and a lot of my life to me in a way that really struck me, that revealed ultimately that there was an invitation uh, to become a priest that Jesus was offering. And kind of after the dust settled and I walked back from uh, from this location, uh, I uh, found myself wrestling with Jesus a little bit like, really, Jesus, are you serious? Like, I think you just invited me. And so we continued on with our with our uh, pilgrimage day. We were coming back from Capernaum, just on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and the individual who was leading our tour uh, had our bus stop, took us off the buses, and led us down to this exact place where I had just been that morning. I didn't know the significance of this place, but he revealed to us that this is prime real estate for fishermen, that for thousands of years, this is the exact place where fishermen would come to tend their nets um, on the Sea of Galilee. And that's significant to the Christian story because this is the exact place where Jesus would have encountered the fishermen, James and John, where he would have invited them to put down their nets and to follow him. And so I was blown away again in that moment, again at that location to realize this is where you called the first priests and Jesus, I think this is where you called me. Wow. Deacon Luke, wow. That is unbelievable. And no, it is so believable because that's how Jesus works and he calls. And I can't wait to take you back to the Ayan Ayov waterfall and to reconnect, go back to these basics, reconnect with our call. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Father. It's going to be awesome to go in preparation for ordination to the priesthood. It's oh, going to be amazing. It sure will be. Awesome. Well, 
Deacons, thank you very much for your assistance this evening. Thank you, everyone at home, for tuning in and for helping us in this endeavor, for supporting us in our mission in this way. We couldn't do it without you, really. So, turning the mic now back to Father Hazing for a final update on our fund to need. Thank you again, Father Sampson, and to all of our deacons for being so articulate in what you are looking forward to and what you've experienced this far. Right now, our fund to need is at $83,825. Uh, We have eight $1,000 contributions that if we get two more, we get that matching $10,000 donation. So let's see if we can get there to 10 $1,000 donations and get that matching donor. Uh, Finally, we invite you to this segment of the Fund and Need where gifts are at the $500 and $100 level. So simply again, search for item 501 in the mobile bidding site or call 314-792-6105. If you wish to make a gift for the Fund and Need after this event, you can do so in the mobile bidding site during the following week. Or you can make a gift directly to the seminary. Just be sure to indicate in a note that your gift is for the Convivium Fund and Need. So make that note. Before we pull the name of the winner for the 50-50 raffle and close the evening, we're at that point to close the evening, please note a few important details. First, the bidding on the silent auction and oral auction items will remain open until 9 p.m. And secondly, if you buy an item this evening, your credit card will be charged automatically for your purchases. To, per- to process payment by cash or check, be, for- be sure to call the help desk here at 314-792-6105 before the auction closes. And purchased items can be picked up at the seminary tomorrow between noon and 2 p.m. for last names beginning with A through L and between 2 and 4 p.m. for last names beginning with M to Z. So items that fit in a 9 by 12 flat envelope will be mailed to your home at no charge, so you can make that pickup or delivery arrangement by contacting the development office at convivium at kenrick.edu or 314-792-7438. All right, 314-792-7438. So now is the time to pull out that raffle winner. The final jackpot total at this time, last time we reported, it was about $11,000. Uh, so we'll see who the winner is. And drum roll, please. Tonight's winner is Pam Peel. So Pam, last name P-I-E-L. She's the winner of our raffle this evening. So Pam, Congratulations. Uh, Before closing, it should be said that this whole facility is filled with equipment. Just want to say a word of thanks to Kate and Molly and Mary and Teresa and all in our development office, all our volunteers and Forgety Services, Bill and Emma, Josh and Ralph in the back. What a great job to bring this this all together in an evening like this was a lot of work and it was a lot of dedication and uh, it shows in the quality, hopefully. Uh, hopefully at the, not at the expense of your MC here, but uh, just want to say that word of thanks to all who put this evening together. As we conclude, we end the evening with seminarians singing. This might be the favorite part of many folks. Many guests say this is their favorite part of the evening. And so we want to keep this uh, beautiful tradition alive this year. As we go now to the seminarians singing the Salve Regina in the chapel of St. Joseph, they've gathered to sing with you to Mary. And I thank you once again for your generous support tonight, and please know that we are praying for all of you. Thank you. Salve Regina, my 